Shabbat Shalom, Mishpukah. It has been a minute. A lot of things have happened to me, to the family. Good things have happened to me in the family. Praise yeah. Nothing brings such joy like the blessing of Almighty Yah. But before I begin, we're going to sing a little song, me and my brothers. Dear to all our hearts, something that we all used to sing, we haven't sung in a while, but I think it really will give us the right mindset to enter into this word. Hallelujah. It's a song that um, Pastor Isaac himself will sing because we have a recording of him singing it. Hallelujah. So for those in their seats, I ask that they give us strength to get through the song and to get through the message. Because it's a hard song to sing. You know how he starts. Think things over. Oh my good days. They outweigh my give me a better mic. Bad days. I, I won't complain. Sometimes my clouds hang low See the world I ask question, yeah So much pain He knows what's best for me. He knows these weary eyes they can't see. The eyes will say, Thank you, yeah. Thank you, yeah. I I won't complain. He yeah. knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for me. Even though these weary eyes, they can't see.
here's what's best for me. He knows what's best for me. No, oh, this no world never be. How many of us understand how good he's been? How many of us recognize that he's the one that dries our tears? We sang a song just now today. He's an on time, yeah. He may not come when you want him. But it'll be there right on time. We don't understand most of the time the things going on in our lives, the hardships, the pain, the good things. Sometimes they come up and they go down. Sometimes we go up and we go down. But if we just trust in Him, and know that He's doing everything for our good. We have no reason to complain. But that's not the message for today. I won't complain is not the message for today. But the message today is three words, really two. It's trials as mercy. If we understand that the things that we go through is Almighty as mercy... In many ways, to give us life, to give us understanding of how to serve Him better. Yeah. That His trials are for building up. That His trials are for our understanding of Him. Then we can't complain about anything. Yeah. That every hardship that we go through, whether it's because of our own fault, or whether it's because He's proving us, we should recognize that it's His mercy. Yes. That it's only by His mercy that we live. Whether in this life or the eternal one. Hallelujah. We all know that we don't deserve eternal life. Yes. No one except Yeshua can deserve eternal life. Yes. So the things that we go through to get us there is not so that we deserve eternal life. Is that so that we don't get death. Turn that down, Shannon, for me. It's so that we don't get death. Because if we keep going the way we do, if we keep going the way we do, what's at the end of our road? Hmm? It's not just the natural death. It's the second death. So, power's too high. This word came to me a while back, actually. But it wasn't until Pastor Backwards' message last week that I had the confirmation that it was time to say it. Hallelujah. 
He talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 8, but we're going to start in Genesis 19. Genesis 19 verse 19. And before we start, I would like to pray. If we could bow our heads. Oh, Maria, our Father in heaven. Father, we thank you for this Shabbat. Yes. We thank you for touching our hearts today. Yes. That you prepare us to receive your word in your word alone, Father. Yeah. Yes. That you touch me. That your word be spoken through me yes. and not any of my own, Father. Yes. But let every heart be attentive and listening yes. to hear and understand, but not just be hearers of the word, Father but be doers also. Yes. That in this Shabbat we may be replenished, may, we may be refreshed, yes. so that we may live according to thy will yes. for the rest of the week, that, this upcoming week, Father. Yeah. Yes. Father, we thank you and bless you in the name of your beloved Son, Yeshua Mashiach. Hallelujah. 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 So we start in Genesis 19, verse 19. We will see one of the first uses of the word mercy. Sometimes some people, Sister Sophia, like to go to where the word was first used to determine, to get an understanding of how we should be using the word. And this is one of the ways we could see it. In verse 19 it says, look, this is Lot. Everyone remember the, the tragedy of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. It says, look, please, your servant has found favor in your eyes. And this is Lot speaking. And you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I am unable to escape to the mountains, lest calamity overtake me and I die. See, in that verse, we think that mercy equates the sparing of life. That mercy equates Father giving us another day. But if you go two verses before in 17, all Maria gave Lot a test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we see, did we recognize the test? Yeah. To not look back right. at the things that were behind you. Yeah. See, we broke down the definition of repentance before, right, Brother Shandon? It is to tear away everything so there's not even a building material left for which to look back to your sin to. Because if there's still something left, have we repented? We're just going to go back. We're just going to build it back up. But if we follow what Lot did, and not his wife, That's right. then mercy will come. Because initially, his whole family was taken out of the cities, correct? His whole family, his wife and his two daughters, were out of the city. And they were given the same test. Right. Not to look back. But only Lot and his two daughters Obey. made it out. Yeah. Why? Because it was them who obeyed all Maria. Hallelujah. It was them who received mercy. Hallelujah. So sometimes mercy depends on us. Yep. See, mercy doesn't have to be we're at the cusp or we're at the brink of disaster or of some consequence that we've done. But it could also be a way to prove us. That after we get through it, then O Maria brings us unto his mercy. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. And this is where I had the confirmation from last week that it was time to, to give the word. Because when we understand trials as mercy, let's look at one of the first few examples that trials was used on Israel. And we know this before. We know this story of their exodus out of Egypt. And Almighty did it for a purpose. And he says, And you shall remember that Yahweh your Elohim led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to what? Humble. To humble you, to prove you, 
to know what is in your heart, whether you guard his commands or not. And what happened? And he humbled you. He let you suffer hunger, fed you manna with which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, to make you know that does that man, to make us understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yah. So, all those times that they were in the wilderness, they didn't have time to plant. They were moving. They lived in tabernacles and tents. So they depended on the sustenance that Almighty had provided them. In all those 40 years, we read that not a sandal rotted. Right? Right? That not one soul went hungry. But in the midst of their trial, many complained. Moses complained of how hard-headed and stiff-necked this people were. But throughout all those times, it was Almighty as mercy. And why did he say that? He says, to what? Humble, to prove, to know what is in our hearts, and to make us understand that man does not live by bread alone. Yeah. See, how many of us has actually been hungry? My dad says he's been hungry before. He would go out to the farm, hunt anything that moves, cook anything that smells, and eat anything that has a some substance. I was telling Michaela, one of the things we used to do in the Philippines was ca- catch beetles in the summer. Remember that, mother? I would go out with my friends, we'd go to the sugar cane fields, and I'd bring home a bag of beetles, and we'd cook them up in some tomatoes. Cassie never got to have them, <laughs> but they were, they were good. And when you're hungry, you might catch some beetles outside, and start eating beetles. <laughs> if, if Almighty tries us by hunger, he might send locusts and beetles for our sustenance. Are we going to be like Israel and say, look, look, Father, I know you sent, you sent manna from heaven. Can we have that instead? <laughs> Are we going to barter with our Elohim? Okay. Are we going to decide what mercy he gives us? Or rather, what trials He gives us so that we become better in serving Him? In Exodus 16, verse 4, see, trials just doesn't happen to everyone alone. Not everyone gets to be tried. Not everyone all Maria proves. Does He prove the world? Does He care what the world does? He cares about his children. Because he cares about those that have the heart to keep his commandments and his witnesses and his truth. In verse 4 we read, and, and this is just a reiteration of the things we read before. And Yeshua and Almighty has said to Moses, See, I am raining bread from the heavens for you, and they shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. In order to try them whether they walk in my Torah or not. Why? Why is that? Why on the six days they shall gather a portion, but on the seventh day, what should they do? Rest. Rest. Not gather anything. So on the sixth day they shall gather a double portion. But we know what ended up happening. Few people still went out and they found none to be gathered. And Almighty I asked the question, how long will I bear with these people? I just gave them the command, written in stone, not too long ago. Yet here they are, already breaking it. How many of us have been in that same position? The word came into our hearts to do a certain thing. 
We got the sign from him. Sometimes we ask for a sign even though we should just obey. Yet still, we don't do it. And then when trials come to make us understand that look, son, daughter of mine, I told you what to do. I gave you a sign on how to do it. And now you're struggling because you didn't and then you come to me? Hallelujah. After I done told you what to do? Hallelujah. Now you got to ask for mercy. Now you got to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Now we got to bow down on our knees. Tears, some of us, some of us, so calloused. No tears. No bowing down. No pain in our heart when we disobey His voice. But yet and still, His mercy prevails. But do we understand how grateful we should be? There, there was a note written there as you walked in. And it says, if you are only given the things you are thankful for every day, what would you have left? How many of us thank Him for His mercy every day? Hmm? How many of us thank Him for the forgiveness of our sins every day? Because sin equates death. But men sin because death or the consequence of sin doesn't come speedily. And because of that, we keep sinning. I remember a message I preached a long time ago, Brother Shannon. One of my favorite ones. Sin makes the heart calloused. See, I have some here calloused hands. And no matter what I do, they'll always be numbed. You can poke them with a needle. Probably won't hurt. I can peel them off. They'll just grow back. You got to work real hard, scrubbing it real hard. Over and over and over for it to become sensitive again. If sin has made our heart calloused, do we understand how much we have to go through to feel Almighty oh, again? To be sensitive to His Word again? To be able to listen and understand and apply His Word in our lives again? See, in Hebrews it says, when you sin willfully now therefore no remaining sacrifice there are sins that are done willfully and there are sins that are done ignorantly but we recognize the sins we do if we have the mind of Almighty Yah, I would say most of the sins we do we know but it they say the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different result. I don't think we're insane. I think we know full well what the result is every time we sin. We're not expecting a different result. We, we want the same result. We're just hoping for mercy. That's it. We're just hoping for mercy that we take for granted. Because once we... Pray. I remember a friend telling me, confessing to me once, that sometimes when he sins, sometimes because of this reason, he sins. He says it feels good to just go through the process of going down and asking for forgiveness. Just the process alone of, of sinning and then going down and asking for forgiveness. Not the receiving of mercy, not the receiving of understanding to not do it again, but just the whole sin, pray, and do it again. That felt good to them. And I couldn't understand why. Why do something you know you shouldn't be doing and then feel bad about it and then feel good just by praying? Is that how Almighty wants us to be? I thought he says, with a meek, humble, and broken heart, a contrite spirit, I will hear you. Yes. Hallelujah. But the process of, of praying, 
feels good and then sometimes we, we sin because that action feels good? How many of us have done that before? I couldn't understand him before, but sometimes lately I can kind of see what he's saying. Not because I feel it myself, but Almighty has opened my eyes enough to see that for some people, that's what this walk is. It's to just be comfortable in the process of being forgiven, at least in their hearts, over and over and over again, and be satisfied in that. But Almighty has said that I will turn them over to a reprobate mind. And it doesn't have to be that you're going to go outside in the world and doing everything that the world's doing. It doesn't have to be that kind of mindset. It just has to be a mindset that's going to prevent you from seeking true repentance and going after His righteousness with all your heart. Hallelujah. See, if we're not there, what did the Master say? You are neither look, you're neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, and I will spew you out. See, sometimes that is the reprobate mind that we put ourselves in. To be comfortable in the same cycle of sin, praying for forgiveness. I notice how I say praying for forgiveness and not true repentance. Praying for forgiveness over and over and over and over again. It's like an addiction sometimes. And we see it either in our lives or in the people around us. But that's where Hadatan wants us to be. To not have the understanding that we should know better. And so when Almighty sends us something to break that cycle, maybe then we'll listen. Maybe then we'll understand that we should be paying attention to His voice. Hallelujah. That we should listen to His voice before our hearts get too calloused Hallelujah. enough to understand yeah. what He's trying to tell us. Yeah. Before He has shut off His voice from speaking to us and then now we're really miserable. Because yeah. now we can't hear His voice. Yeah. He says, though they search for me, they cry for my word, they won't find it. He says, his spirit will not strive with man always. Yes. Now that was in Noah's time, but that's applicable to our lives today. Yes. There's a limit to how much we can provoke mm -hmm. all Maria, the, creation of the, the creator of the universe. In Genesis chapter 22, another example of a trial that was for a purpose. Because we had this discussion last week or the week before during uh, the last day, I believe, of what is a trial. Is a trial the same as temptation? One brings us to understanding or closeness to Almighty Yah. And one brings us to sin. Really the difference is just the outcome. But the way it's presented to us, a lot of times it's similar. And one of the few times, one of the first times someone was tried is Abraham. And we know the story. We can read it right here. And it came to be that after these events, Genesis 22.1, that Elohim tried Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And Almighty I said, Take your son now, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as an ascending offering on one of the mountains which I command you. Now, the, the verse just goes on to say that Abraham did it. But I wonder if in his mind, he was asking, did I hear that right? Did I hear that right, Brother Flem? My son, the one you promised me, the one I waited nearly a hundred years for? That son? And you want me to offer him as a sacrifice? 
like the Gentiles do? That's what you want me to do? No, but the verse just going on and says, and Isaac prepared and he got ready. We don't know what went on in his head. But I feel like as a father's heart, not me, I don't have a son. But for the fathers out here, for the parents out here, it might take at least a few seconds to just get up and do it. If you love your child, it might take a little bit more than a few seconds to just get up and do it. Huh? But all Maria was trying to teach Abraham something. Not just to prove Abraham's faith. Okay? But he was trying to teach him something that maybe he didn't really understand. See, all Maria already fulfilled the promise. He already gave his son Isaac. But look here in verse 14. After all Maria said, stop. I will provide the lamb. But what came out? A ram. A grown sheep. A grown goat is what came out. We know the lamb is Yeshua. In verse 14, because of that event, Abraham called the name of the place Yahweh Yireh. As it is on this day on the mountain, Yahweh provides. See, that message didn't hone in to Abraham until he understood at the cost of my son's life in exchange for my son's life all Maria provided. Do we understand that? We may lose something sometimes. We may be brought to a point where it seems like we have nothing left. But if all of that is to teach us that he is our provider I think that's a worthy cause. I think I would go through that trial. Maybe not Abraham's trial. Yeah, forbid. Maybe not his trial, but a trial in which he can teach me, son, I will provide your every need. Everything that happens to you, I know. If you feel like you have no food, no water to drink, no clothes to put on, no friends to call on, no family to love and talk to, I will be there to carry you. Hallelujah. Yahweh will provide. Yes. Who here understands that truly? Yes. See, when I, was, when I was in Argentina, and I always go back to that story, because it's one of the you know, memorable experiences for me, there was a point where I was running out of money, because I like to spend money. And I had a limited amount of money. But I also had my dad's credit card. Or, or rather, a few credit cards directed to his bank account. So when it was time for my dad to provide, it was my dad who provided. Did it enter in my mind that it was all Maria who provided? See, I was in a different continent on the opposite side of the world. If any of those credit cards did not work, I'd still be there. I'd be speaking Spanish a lot better, but I'd still be there. I'll find my way. I'll talk to some lunch ladies, right, Brother Flem? They'll feed me some cabbage. But see, that doesn't enter my mind because I wasn't really struggling for it. I wasn't starving for it. So sometimes Almighty has to bring us way down for us to understand that He is your provider. He had to show my dad that working four jobs, working himself to the bone, crying nearly every night because my dad thought he can provide but it wasn't until he reached that point that Oh Maria said, Do you understand me now? Hallelujah. Do you hear me now? You didn't have to do any of this. Yes. The father never asked him to do that. He took it upon himself. Yes. And so Oh Maria just increased the pressure, turned up the heat. 
I don't feel the heat right now, but maybe later I will. He turned up the heat for my dad so my dad could understand. Okay, Father, yeah. I will turn everything to you. You provide for my children. Get them valedictorians and scholarships, which he has done. He's kept that promise. And my father said, me and my wife will provide for your family in the Philippines. Your people in the Philippines. And Almighty has provided. Yeah. See, my friends always, all my, all my friends always are confused when I tell them, you did all of that on your dad's salary? See, I have, I have friends who had the same job. I remember a friend of mine back in high school, my dad knows this, her, his mom was a teacher like my dad. His dad worked a job unlike my mom, who did not at the time work a job. But the difference was we were living in a house. We had two cars. We were eating well. We were never hungry. But for him and his family, they were living in an apartment month to month. Didn't know when the next salary was coming, even though the mom had a secure job. And so when I told him, yeah, my dad's a teacher too, he was shocked. He could not understand how they could be making nearly the same amount of money. My dad, my dad, because my dad tried to get that same job my, my, my friend's mom did. And they paid more. And she worked virtually also. But my dad got paid less, sent money to the Philippines, had a mortgage, had car notes, had three children to feed, yet still had money left over in the savings. How? Someone could be making more money on paper but living more poorly. My parents themselves don't understand where it comes from. I don't know, maybe they stole. <laughs> Did you? Time to confess, pops. Almighty I provide. See, if that isn't proof for me, I don't know what will be. If I don't learn from them right there, then Almighty I will find a way to teach me. He'll find a way to teach me and make me understand that He is the provider. I'm not the provider. He's the provider. I remember when Pastor Isaac was driving that van, but in his heart, Almighty was telling him to stop and just focus on the Word. But Pastor Isaac was making a lot of dough driving that van. And what happened, Mama Audrey? He got in an accident. Tore the wheel clean off. Yeah. And what did the word say to him, Dad? Yeah. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Is that what's going to take for us? For all Maria to say to us, in the midst of our calamity, after he's shown us a way out, before we even enter it, do you hear me now? So we should be appreciative yes. that we can learn of him without having to go through all these things. His word is here for us for our understanding. It's up to us to hear and understand and live according to his word. In Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 15. Jeremiah 30 verse 15. Besides teaching us to show us that He is the provider. Sometimes He makes us go through things just because we don't give Him enough credit. Go back again to that thing that Pastor Isaac posted on that poster over there near the wall. What will you have if you only have the things you were thankful for every day? In verse 15 it says, Why do you cry out about your breach? Your pain is incurable. Because of your many crookedness, because your sins have increased, I have done this to you. In verse 18, thus said Almighty Yah, despite our sins, despite our many crookedness, despite our iniquity, and despite the punishment that we're receiving then because of it, Almighty Yah says, see, I turn back the captivity of Jacob's tents, 
and have compassion in his dwelling house. And the city shall be built again upon its own mound, and the palace stand on its right place. Why? And out of them shall arise thanksgiving, and the voice of those who are laughing. And I shall increase them, and they shall not diminish, and I shall esteem them, and they shall not be small. Sometimes all Maria, He just wants us to be thankful. Yes. How good does it feel, would it feel, or rather how bad would it feel, if our children, we pour everything out for them, and we don't even get a thanks. Yeah. Parents, you have a thankless job. Doctors, we get thanked all the time sometimes, so I'm not worried about that. But parents, you get thankless jobs. Poplar doesn't thank you. Not in, not in words. I don't thank my mom or my dad sometimes. But sometimes that is all they're asking for. They'll give us the world. And all they want is a little bit of gratitude. That's right. Do we think the Father is any different in that regard? No. See, He not only gave us the world, He gave us the maker of the world. He gave us His Son, which was with Him in creation for the forgiveness of our sins, for a chance at eternal life. But are we thankful as we should be? Or is it going to take us going into our own captivity to make us realize I should have been thankful all along? That I should have been thankful of Almighty as mercy and forgiveness all along? So next time maybe we ask, why, is, why am I going through this? Maybe it's because we just lacked a little gratitude. Maybe Almighty I put that word in place, well, you weren't thankful for this, you weren't thankful for that. I've been giving you these years and years. Now it's time for me to peel it back a little and see what you're made of. Will you seek me then? Will you thank me then? See, when the things that were happening to you was happening to him, he cursed the day he was born. But he says, he still says, Almighty God gives and he takes away. Now, maybe in the midst of our calamity, we may not be able to thank Almighty God. But one of my dad's favorite things to go to is, though you cry all night long, joy comes in the morning. For just that thanksgiving at the end of it, just for that goodness at the end of it, maybe we can hang on and not give up. In Psalm 94 verse 18, I'll try not to keep you all too long. Mr. Johnson isn't here to remind me, but I will try to keep us not too long. Almighty oh, also has proven to us time and time again that he's ready to pick us up. Yes. Not just because of the trials he put in our lives, but because of our own things that we've done. Because of our own heart that has brought us down. In 18, it says, When I said my foot has slipped, when I fell, your mercy, O Most High Yah, supported me. When we can't get our foot underneath us and we can't stand on our own, it's all Maria's mercy that supports us. Yes. It's His mercy that's able to keep us up. Yes. In 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel verse 12, chapter 12, verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. We'll give context of this verse that David wrote. We'll understand why it's his mercy that supported him. Mm -hmm. We know the story, right? Yes, David, the messed up. Yeah. He took someone's wife. Yeah. He killed that wife's husband. Yeah. And he covered it up. 
But when the word came, he was brought to our understanding. We know the story. David says, what? Curse that man? No, he didn't curse that man. He says, that man should pay. Four times more, I think. And he should be killed. And all my dad said, well, all right. That's what you said? Here's what I say. And now the sword does not turn aside from your house. Because you have despised me. Because you have despised me. Did we reach any point where David said, I hate Almaria? No. He loves Almaria. Almaria says, David is the man after my own heart. David was his favorite. But Almaria here says, because you have despised me. We don't have to say it. We don't have to feel that we hate all Maria. But if we transgress his commandments willfully, we don't have to feel it. I don't have to tell my dad I hate him. But if I go and start speeding and racking up tickets and just spending his money willy-nilly, he's going to come to me. Son, why do you hate me? Why do you want me to suffer? That's what we're saying to all Maria when we sin. Do we understand that? Yeah. We can feel love as we think for all Maria all day long. I'm sure a lot of people in the world feel like they love all Maria. But Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Revelation says, these are those that love me. Right. They that keep my commandments. Yeah. He did it both ways. As a command, if you love me, prove it. Yeah. And as a result, those that keep my commandments, they're the ones that love me. Hallelujah. See, we think in gray areas. That's what we do. That's in, in our minds, we think in gray areas. But in Almighty Yah, you love me or you hate me. You cannot serve two masters. You're either hot or cold. But his mercy, ooh, his mercy. His mercy brings us out of that gray area into a full understanding of the things that we're doing wrong. So that even though we say we love him, and we sin against him. Oh Maria has mercy on us and shows us where we went wrong. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that we can fix it. It's not just so we can look at it like a piece of art. No, it's so that we can fix what we've done. So that we can give him the command in our bodies, in our minds, and turn everything over to him. Hallelujah. He's knocking. He stands at the door knocking. He's ready to fix whatever needs to be fixed. Whatever is broken, he's ready to fix that. Are we going to let him in? Verse 11, Thus said Yahweh, See, I am raising up a evil against you from your own house, and shall take your wives before your eyes, and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. And here it is. Here's the kicker. You did it in secret. You did it in secret. How many of us do it in secret? Hmm? Think nobody knows. Think nobody's watching. But I shall do this deed before all of Israel and before the sun. That's the king of Israel. He may have sinned against Almaria, thinking he did it in secret. But retribution came wide open. We better start asking for mercy. Because not only would we shame ourselves, if Almaria brought in the open his punishment for us. See, as opposed to Yov, his friends questioning him, 
the things he must have done to deserve such things, maybe for us, we won't have to question. The things that we did in secret, we'll understand then, oh, Father has bring it upon me now. My friends and family see it now, and then now they mock me because of things happening to me, but also his name is on us. Yes. We are called upon as his children. See, Almighty Dad does things for his name's sake. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And sometimes he spares us only because of his name's sake. Whoa. See, we're like specks of dust. We, Shannon said it this morning. Mm-hmm. Dust we came, yes. dust where we turn. But it's his name, his spirit in us Woo. that makes us valuable Hallelujah. to him. Hallelujah. See, without Hallelujah. his spirit, without his mind, without his name, what did, that, what did that man say who had his wise eyes wide open? And when Yeshua opened his eyes, there's a few. One of them, he says, I see man as trees. Uh-huh. But then also it says, well, I guess that wasn't the story. Yeshua said, leave, let the dead bury the dead. The man was still alive. When Yeshua talked to him, he says, well, come to me, come and follow me now. Yeah, and follow. But he was going to bury his father. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Without Almighty in us, Without his mind in us, we are worthless. See, how can we have value if the only thing that is worth to him is his righteousness, his goodness? Everything else is sin. Everything else he was ready to burn up. But he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. But those who don't, What's the consequence? So for us, are we not grateful that He put His Spirit in us? That He put His mind in us so that we are of value to Him? In verse 13, it says, And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against Yah. Here's the good part. Here's the mercy. And Nathan said to David, And so... Almighty has put away your sin. You shall not die. Did he come out unscratched though? No. No. David did not come out unscratched. Almighty has said, you will suffer these things out in the open, but I will spare your life. Why? Because you have recognized your sin. You have come upon me with a contrite spirit. We read it in Psalm already, right? When my foot has slipped... Yeah, your mercy supported me. Imagine if David heard from Nathan and said, and because of your sin, you shall die today. No support there. No mercy there. But it is we're standing on our feet today because of his mercy. His, his, was it James? Or was it John who said, um, every man has fallen short. Every man has fallen short of the glory of Al Maria. So it's by mercy alone. Right? But he reigns on the just and the unjust. Because Al Maria would rather that no one perish. Al Maria would rather no one perish. That's why maybe he's still holding himself from fulfilling the rest of his prophecies. But as we know, and as he prophesied, not everyone's going to make it. There's a wide and narrow gate. There's the narrow gate and there's a wide gate. Most people are on the wide gate. Unbeknownst to them. Some people swap every now and then. Huh? Some people swap every now and then. Sometimes when we feel like it, I'll take the narrow gate. I'll take the straight and narrow path. And then when everything's going good, uh, it'd be nice to go, you know, have some space, stretch my arms and my legs, do what I want to do. Hmm? It's Shabbat, and you know what? 
My boss is calling. He said he's gonna pay me a thousand dollars an hour. I could use. I could take my wife to Disney World. I could take my mom to a cruise. Oh, that thousand dollars an hour. I go for just three hours, Father. Yeah, just three hours. My mortgage is paid for that month. See, that's what we do. We swap between a narrow and the wide. But if we're in the wide and we die in it, only those in the narrow make it in. But if you're in the wide gate and you die in it, are you somehow going to teleport to the narrow one? No. It doesn't work like that. There's only been a couple of people that's been described in Scripture that teleported. And we're not it. At least not yet. Yeah. Ezekiel said, man be righteous his whole life. Yeah. He sins and dies in it. His righteousness is forgotten. Maybe that's what that is. This narrow and wide gate. You swap and before you get a chance to go back, you're in there. There's only one destination for that wide gate and there's only one destination for that narrow one. That is it. So I would, I would say I would rather stay in a narrow one. But let's be honest. We, we go back and forth. Let's be honest. We go back and forth. And it's His mercy like here with David that we have the understanding to repent and ask for forgiveness. And He says to His death, spare Him. You shall not die. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Mercy. What is in exchange for that? Proverbs 3 1. In exchange for that, he's asking one thing. And it's for our own good. Everything the Father does, Romans 8 28, is for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Chapter 3, verse 1, he says, My son or my child, do not forget my laws and let your heart watch over my commands. For length of days and long of life and peace they add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. And thus you find favor and good insight in the eyes of Elohim and man. In verse 5, trust Yahweh with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Hallelujah. But are, do, we, do we understand the full consequence of the word, let your heart watch over my commandments? See, I preached a message a long time ago, or not too long ago. It's called, He is watching over. And to break it down, watching over isn't just like sitting back like this, just looking. No. Watching over means to bend forward and watch closely. To observe and look intently at what you're looking at. That is how the Father looks at us. And that's how He wants us to watch over His commandments. To watch over His Word. Because if we don't take our eyes off of His Word then we won't stray. Yes. But if we get misdirected, how many of you can walk in a straight line with your eyes closed? Can we? No, we have a tendency to lean one way or the other and we're going to go in circles. It's been done in many experiments. If you're given a wide enough field and you close your eyes and ask to walk a straight line, you're going to go back in a circle. How many of us can drive with our eyes closed and stay in a straight line? No? No? But how many of us do it in our lives? What do we do? What are we asking Almighty Yet to do when we sin? We're asking Him not to look at us. We're asking Him to turn His attention away from us. And when He does, anything can get you. Anything can get you. But if we keep our eyes on His Word, it should be impossible yes. to sin against Him. Hallelujah. It should be impossible 
to sin against the Most High if we keep our eyes on His Word, if we keep our heart on His commandments. Hallelujah. It should be. Yes, sir. So that means if it isn't, that means our heart and our eyes is not always on Him. It's that simple. Yeah. See, Almighty I laid it all out. Bible, I remember someone used to say, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions. Basic instructions before leaving earth. This is all so simple. We don't need to go to college. We don't need to get an MD degree. You don't even need to finish high school to understand how basic this is. Do as you're told, obey, and you live. But no, we are a hard-headed and stiff-necked children. So, what happens if we don't do it? We go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 17. If we don't keep our eyes, our heart in His Word, it says here, Therefore, Almighty God does not rejoice over their young ones and has no compassion on the fatherless and widows. For everyone is defiled and evil. And if your word is not on your, on your mouth, his word is not on your mouth, every mouth speaks foolishness. And with all his displeasure has not turned back and his hands are still stretched out. For wrongness burns as the fire and it consumes thorn bushes and weeds and sets the bushes of the forest ablaze. And they roll up like a rising smoke. When Almighty uh, is done, everyone will see His wrath. And who can spare man from Almighty uh's wrath? Are we going to be the young people here that Almighty uh does not rejoice over? Are we going to be the fatherless and widows, the defiled and evil ones, the ones who spare this is, where, this is where I think a lot of us can get, get the ones speaking foolishness. See, we, we know and we understand and we believe the power of the tongue. Hmm? We believe that the word, when it is spoken, it does not come back void. We believe that the power of the word has been placed in us. But how many of us still speak foolishly? I know I do. Oh, I love to speak. I love to speak. And a lot of times I speak foolishly. Why? It's fun. Sometimes we do it just because it's fun. Or sometimes we do it because we get angry. Not someone's fault. Pastor Blackwell always, say, always likes to make fun of those who say, Well, you done made me mad. And he says, Well, if I can make you mad, I can make you righteous too. <laughs> but no, you made yourself mad. You allowed yourself to get angry. You allowed those words to come out of your mouth. What we speak reflects the thoughts in our hearts. But the tongue is really, truly unruly. But if we are like those who speak foolishness, and it's because Almighty has word is not in our heart at all times, then what it says, Almighty God doesn't rejoice over that. He has no pleasure in that. And if he wants to, we can be like thorn, those thorn bushes and weeds burnt up. For all the words to see the smoke of the destruction in our lives. We've seen it around, right? We can see brothers and sisters or family and relatives where everything just seems to be going wrong. And we pray for him and we pray for him and we pray for him. And nothing is going right. That's the smoke we're seeing. That's a signal. A warning for those watching. That don't be like these areas that's burning up. But how many of us heed that warning? In Numbers 20 verse 7. Numbers 20 verse 7. Sometimes again. Besides understanding, besides appreciation, Almighty gives us trials, 
to bring us down. Barashan, if you could read verse 7 all the way down to 12 for me. And Almighty God spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron. And you shall speak to the rock before your eyes, and it shall give its water. You shall drink water from them out of the rock, and you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation. Mm -hmm. Livestock. Mm -hmm. And Moses took the rod from before Almighty Yah as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron assembled the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice. Mm -hmm. And much water came out. And the congregation and their livestock drank. But Almighty God spoke to Moses and to Aaron, because you did not believe me mm. to set me apart in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you do not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. Moses struck the rock twice. Yeah. Almighty God has taken them through a year and some months in the wilderness already. He's given them water out of the rock already. And Almighty has said, speak unto the rock. But from Moses' experience, if we go to Exodus 17, in Exodus 17 verse 4, it says, And Moses cried out to Yahweh, saying, What am I to do with this people? Yet in a little while they shall stone me. And Yahweh said to Moses, Pass over before the people. Take with you some of the elders, and take in your hand with your rod, which you struck the river, and go. And see, I am standing before the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out, and the people shall drink. See, Moses was thinking of that first event, that he struck the rock once. And so when it happened here, and Almighty God said, no, I want you to speak to the rock this time. But Moses was like, no, I struck the rock there. I'm going to just do that. And he did it twice. And what happened? The, the water came out. But because of Moses' disobedience, he was not able to see step foot into the promised land. See, we know, we recognize Moses to be the most humble man. Right? He was meek and humble. From all the way from when he was called out and, and speaking to the Pharaoh, he was shy and afraid of his stuttering. But he was the one that spoke anyway. And he's been recognized as a humble man. But what was it that caused him to hit the rock twice instead? Why did he disobey? Hmm? Is it out of his anger? That the people? He was angry the first time. He was. He was angry the first time when he struck the rock once. But this time he did it twice instead of speaking to it. Why? He did not think that Almighty Yah would care. He's done it a certain way before. What makes a difference? I think that's what's happening. Almighty Yah may have told us something different. Well, how many of us, for example, for those of us who weren't born into the faith, like me and Shandon and my sister, had to change things up. Had to do things in a different way. Hmm? Yeah. Moses is like that. Instead of hitting the rock, Almighty I said, speak to it. Well, it worked before. It was fine before. Is that what we thought too, my Marjorie? Yeah. When Pastor Isaac came to you and said, well, honey, you got to start the food. Your pork chops. <laughs> you were... Your Christmas. <laughs> Those hard things who we, that we thought were okay before. Right? But Almighty has said, no, this time I'm dealing with you differently. And you either humble yourself and understand and obey that. Or you're going to think it's okay. See, how many of us have witnessed to people time and time and time again? Why we're not doing the 
of the Easter? Why are we not doing the Christmas? Why are we not eating pork? Why are we not eating crawfish? We witness time and time again. And what do most people say? Well, my pastor told me it's okay. Well, the Bible I read says it's okay. My grandma did it. He's, she's been doing it her, all her life. So it's okay. See, when Almighty God speaks, you shall listen. Hallelujah. That's the word. Yeah. But because of our comfort, because of what we'd known, we refuse to change. We refuse to change. And it doesn't have to be something like that. Maybe it could be, for example, when we used to, the way we observed Shabbat was drive for an hour, two hours, get to church, listen to my dad preach for like 45 minutes, eat, and then time to party. Go to the mall, go to the park, eat, buy whatever. It was the one time we could enjoy life out of the village. And so we had fun. And then one day, we were driving down out of Tennessee, and it was getting dark. It was Friday. And my dad looked at the odometer. Pastor Isaac was driving. And we looked at him. It's like, are we going to get gas? And we stopped at a gas station. We stopped at a gas station, but we didn't get gas. No, my mom Audrey, you need to use the restroom. That was it. My dad's wondering, sitting there, why isn't, why isn't an old man getting gas? <laughs> we're still in Mississippi. It's empty. He didn't get gas though. And we made it home. And if my dad didn't think to himself then that he was going to change how he was going to observe Shabbat, if he didn't realize then that that was Almighty as speaking to him, as a leader called out amongst his people to set an example for his people, for his family, if my dad had the hard heart to say, well, Pastor Isaac can do it that way. I'll do it this way. I've been doing it for 20 years and it's been okay. There's no need to change. It could be like that. It could be something we think as simple as that. If we don't hear and obey the word when it speaks to us, maybe we'll be like Moses. We'll get to see the gates. But we're not walking in. Hmm? In Isaiah 55, verse 6. Isaiah 55, verse 6. It says, Seek Yahweh while He is to be found. And call on Him while He is near. And what? Let the wrong forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to all Maria who has mercy or compassion on him and to our Elohim for he pardons much. Uh, yeah. See, he finds the people that have the heart to turn back to him. Yes. And he gives them a way out. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's what we recognize is when we sin against all Maria, was it John Pops who said, if you sin, there is now therefore an intercessor between you and all Maria. Whenever the things in our heart, in our mind, the things we think aren't righteous, we know that there is a still small voice sometimes, if not all the time, telling us, now you know you can stop that thought. You don't have to keep going because if lust is there or desire is there, sin is conceived. And when sin has been carried out, it's death. So we can kill it. We can kill sin while it is here. Before we get ourselves killed. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes we just end up in the wrong place in the wrong time mm. because of the sin in our heart. Mm. But we could kill it in our heart 
then and there. And Al Maria is able to forgive us. Al Maria is willing to forgive us. We know that Al Maria doesn't tempt us, right? He does not tempt us with evil things. We tempt ourselves. When we ask, when Yeshua said, pray this prayer, and one of the things it says is, lead us not into temptation. That was more than truth. Because all Maria will not lead us temptation unto sin. But really how it should be said, and how it should be translated is, lead us not unto heavy trials. I believe that's what Yeshua was really saying. Because all Maria is going to be true to his word and will not tempt us. Yes, sir. But when we are in temptation, he is going to find a way for us to get out of it. Yes. To not go all the way. In Romans 9, chapter 15, I mean, Romans chapter 9, verse 15. I'm almost done. Romans 9, verse 15. For he says to Moshe, I shall favor whom I favor, and I shall have mercy whomever I have mercy. So then it is not him who is wishing, nor of him who is running, but of Elohim who shows favor. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this same purpose I have raised you up, to show my power in you, and that my name be declared in all the earth. We know he used Job as an example for us to learn from. We know he used Moses. He used Pharaoh to, to proclaim his name on all the earth. How many of us think he can use us? See, we are called to be a what? A light yes. unto the world. Yes. And no one hides a city on a, that's on a mountain or a lamp, right? A shining lamp can't be hid on a mountain. You'll see it. But what do I do with ourselves? Why, we do, we, why do we try to stop His light from shining? Hmm? When it's all Maria who has chosen us. Again, I remember a few friends of mine, again, I, it's telling me the same story. I'm telling the same story, and we've heard all of this before. Out of siblings who were raised the Christian way, why only him? Right? Out of my dad's siblings, he's got eight of them, why only him at first? And if he did not answer the call with which he was called for, it would really only be him, and then sooner or later, not him. But now his siblings are in too. His siblings have changed your lives also. But if he did not answer the call and did not shine the light that was placed in him, his, their blood will be on his hands. We recognize that it is all Maria who chose us. Hallelujah. But how many of us are choosing Him? You, Every day. Right? We read that Paul says he, he dies daily. We just got to choose Him every day. Hallelujah. To choose His Word every day. Hallelujah. Yes. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, why choose His Word? It says, because trustworthy is the word and worthy of all acceptance. That Messiah Yeshua came into the world to save sinners. This is Paul. Of whom I am foremost. Saul was killing those who were following Messiah. But because of this I received mercy. So that in me first... Alma Yeshua HaMashiach might display all patience as an example to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Hallelujah. The things that we have done, the things that we always think I can never get back from, it's in those moments that Yeshua plucks us up, cleans you up, turns you from scarlet 
and to white as snow uh -huh. and then presents you for the world to see. See how good I am. Yeah. See, when we're so down, like Paul was, and he was plucked out, out of the Damascus road, Paul didn't have to obey. He was, he's always had the choice. But because he humbled himself, even though he recognized then that, my goodness, I'm the worst one. I've been killing the ones who worship and believe in the Messiah. He, if he let himself so down that he can't ever see himself up with Yeshua, he wouldn't be able to get out of the Damascus Road. But he accepted the mercy of all Maria. Yeah. He accepted the life that he was given a second chance. So what? So that those who believe in Yeshua can have everlasting life. Why? Because he has been set as an example. He was there for the Gentiles. So for us who like sometimes get down because of the things we did in the past. The things we've done in the past that still hold us back, whether to our wives, to our husbands, to our children, to our own self, our friends and family, the anger issues maybe, the, for me, the pride, all those things, if we can't let it go and accept the mercy of all Maria. I remember Minister Gray, sometimes he preached a message once that when you ask for forgiveness, believe the forgiveness. Believe that He is merciful and loving to forgive you. Sometimes we are so stricken with guilt that we can't forgive ourselves. And it's that unforgiveness unto ourselves that's stopping all Maria from giving His mercy. From giving His comforter. But just like Saul, we should be able to accept His mercy. So then we can be a light unto the world. We can't be a light all depressed because of our sins. If we ask for forgiveness and mean it, then we should trust all Maria enough that He is able to forgive us. And just leave it all behind. So that we can look forward to what's ahead of us. Look forward to the job He's given us. In Philippi chapter 2 verse 25, Philippians chapter 2 verse 25. This reminds me of Job actually. This story about, or not even a story really, it's about a certain man. His name is Epaphrodos. Epaphroditos, but it's just like Job in that sometimes the hardships that we go 